the, the most important strategy in the United States, what I call this, what he calls the Tom Sawyer strategy, which is trying to figure out how to get other global stakeholders to paint your fence. I'll let him describe uh, what, that, what that means. Uh, to Brian's left, we have my colleague and great friend Peter Bergen. Of course, we know Peter is the guy who in uh, the 1990s tracked down Osama bin Laden when the CIA couldn't find him, uh, and uh, is really uh, of the bin Laden franchise, of those who watch terrorism, who watch what al-Qaeda is about. Uh, Peter is without um, real rival, in my view. He's director of the National Security Studies Program at the New America Foundation, terrorism analyst at CNN, and most recently author of The Longest War, The Enduring Conflict Between America and Al-Qaeda, which I highly recommend uh, to folks. Then we have Matthew Ho, who is the director of the Afghanistan Study Group, a senior fellow at the Center for International Policy, uh, which is a uh, host and, and partner with the Afghanistan Study Group, a former State Department official in U.S. Marine in Afghanistan and Iraq, uh, and just a very cool guy uh, besides. Uh, and then we have Ambassador James Dobbins. Jim uh, has held almost every uh, great position in government, Assistant Secretary of State, Special Assistant to the President, whether, you know, he is, uh, of course, one of the people who, who was pivotal and key in putting together the Bonn uh, Agreement in Afghanistan and was the President's uh, special representative in that. Uh, but it doesn't matter whether it's Haiti or Bosnia. Jim is really one of the great, uh, America's great global architects. And then we have the great pleasure to moderate this next panel, Susan Glasser, uh, who's editor-in-chief of Foreign Policy Magazine. I do a lot of, of global speaking. I also go to places like Tulsa, Oklahoma, Dubuque, Iowa, speak to the Committee on Foreign Relations, hang out with professors. And her recent issue of 100, the 100 top thinkers in the world is uh, invariably sitting on the pile of red. And it's red. It's not just a magazine. People are either leafing through to see if they're in there, uh, and, and if not, to see uh, how foreign policy, but foreign policy, I think, and I just want to say one word, there are lots of magazines out there, uh, and, and you get a piece of paper, you see a magazine, there, there, there are very few that I think have picked up, and I say this as sort of a new media guy, who get the importance of networks, and that ideas are, it's not the feeling of a magazine that's just a brick and mortar uh, done on paper, that it is in fact a network of ideas, and the currents running through foreign policy today is what has made it uh, such a nationally acclaimed and, and highly uh, uh, acclaimed and award uh, recip uh, receiving uh, magazine. So please welcome Susan Glasser. Yes. Well, thank you, Steve, who, of course, in true form has already gone off to organize another panel. I'm sure you'll all be invited to tomorrow. Uh, <laughs> so thank you very much. Uh, although he has, has stepped out, he has given me strict instructions uh, for this conversation. And so I will, I will do my best to keep us on it. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of the waterfront that we're going to be covering today when it comes to the questions surrounding the war in Afghanistan. But I think the mission of this group is to look specifically at surfacing what are real options, possibilities, and opportunities in this moment when it comes to thinking about the American engagement in Afghanistan, uh, what about negotiations, what's realistic. There's a lot of talk. Some of the clocks are very differently set when it comes to Kabul versus Washington and vice versa. And I think we have pretty much an, an all-star group of people to help navigate us through, you know, cutting through behind what's rhetoric and what's reality at this, at this moment in time. And I, I can't think of anyone better to start us off than um, Ambassador Dobbins, who, as we were just discussing out front, uh, is also in many ways the architect of this, uh, perhaps uh, not entirely wittingly, of this status quo we've been in with President Karzai for the last decade. And I'm hoping he can start us off today by walking through what some of our options are. Thank you. Thank you. I, I love being introduced as the man who brought you President Karzai. Um, <laughs> you know, um, the, the American objective in uh, Afghanistan is often uh, stated as uh, preventing that country from becoming uh, a sanctuary for al-Qaeda. Um, I would amend that slightly by saying that we want to prevent the country from becoming a sanctuary for or an ally with al-Qaeda. Um, uh, that was its status prior to 2001. That is, it wasn't simply a sanctuary. It was an ally of al-Qaeda. Uh, and that's why it's different from Yemen or Somalia or Pakistan, uh, places with weak governments or no government at all, but not a government that's actively allied. Uh, with a global terrorist movement. And that's what Afghanistan could become again uh, if the Taliban uh, were able to resume power backed by uh, al-Qaeda, as it is uh, at least for the moment. Um, 
Now, the, the mood in the United States is pretty pessimistic about Afghanistan and our chances of succeeding uh, there, and I think that's to some degree been reflected in uh, today's discussions. Uh, interestingly enough, um, uh, Afghan, Afghans have a rather different uh, perception of their future and don't share uh, the pessimism that uh, pervades uh, American opinion. Um, uh, if you uh, ask Afghans whether their country is moving in the right direction, 59% uh, of them say they think it is. That's verse, uh, versus 28% uh, uh, of Americans who have a similar opinion regarding the United States. Um, if you ask them the, cl the classic Ronald Reagan question, are you better off today than you were five years ago, 63% uh, of Afghans uh, respond, yes, they are better off. This is contrast to a drop of 40% in the U.S. Uh, consumer uh, confidence index over the last year. Um, it, it, uh, uh, we tend to think of President Karzai uh, as illegitimate, uh, inept, and corrupt. Uh, in Afghanistan, uh, he enjoys a 62% uh, personal popularity rating, um, and uh, rather his government uh, uh, enjoys a 62% uh, approval rating, and he personally has an 82% popularity rating. I imagine uh, most recent American presidents would be very pleased with those kinds of numbers. Um, support for the U.S. troop presence uh, in the latest polls is at 62% uh, in Afghanistan, which contrasts to 31% support for American troop presence in Afghanistan, in American opinion. Um, now, why are the Afghans so confident? What's going on? Well, I think it's pretty easy to explain. Since 2001, the GDP has gone up uh, 300%. Um, there's uh, 8 million children in school today versus 1 million in 2001, of whom uh, some 2 million are girls. 80% um, of Afghans now have access uh, to at least some basic, basic health care facilities. Infant mortality is down. Longevity is up. Um, assuming the children who are in school today stay in school, in 10 years, Afghanistan's literacy rate will have tripled. And perhaps the most interesting statistic at all, uh, over half the Afghan population now have telephones, um, whereas virtually none had telephones um, nine years ago. Uh, security does continue to deteriorate in Afghanistan, um, and that's a serious source of concern. The UN said that 2,700 uh, Af Afghan civilians were killed last year uh, in the war, um, and that's a number that's uh, up from the previous year. But 2,700, that would be a bad week in Iraq in 2006, not a bad year. Um, and in fact, the Iraqi figures are still higher than uh, they are in Afghanistan. Um, so I think that this, uh, uh, that, that, you know, the Afghans project their future the same way we do. That is, they compare their recent past to their current past, and they project it into the future. And so their, their life has improved, and they project that in the future. Most Americans feel that their life hasn't improved over the last couple of years, and they're projecting that into the future. And I think that explains why a lot of the debate in this country is not so much over uh, ends and means in Afghanistan or even the prospects for success, but the costs. And the costs are now the dominant fa uh, uh, factor in uh, addressing uh, the future of American strategy. Um, uh, now, our theme today is, uh, is our, our solutions rather than descriptions of the problem. And uh, I think Tom Pickering in the last panel talked a good deal about the uh, Century Foundation report that he and I and a number of other American and, uh, and, uh, and uh, non-American officials uh, were instrumental in putting together, uh, supporting the, the prospect for a, a, a peace negotiation. Uh, in Afghanistan. Um, uh, I don't want to uh, repeat what Tom had to say. I will note that there is very strong public support throughout, uh, Afghan, uh, throughout Afghan society for some kind of negotiated solution. Uh, this support is uh, not reflected uh, in uh, some of the uh, political leadership in Kabul and in the civil society elements of Kabul. Um, uh, for obvious reasons, as they're somewhat apprehensive about the outcomes. But it does transcend not just the Pashtun community, but the other major ethnic communities in the country. And President Karzai is clearly reflecting uh, public opinion uh, when he endorses uh, these, uh, these prospects. Um, the, uh, uh, my own view is that, uh, that peace negotiations are, uh, are worth pursuing uh, even if they fail. I think the risks 
for the uh, Taliban uh, and for the insurgency are much greater than the risks for the government uh, and for NATO and the, and the United States. Um, uh, they're fighting a jihad, a holy war. Um, uh, and it's, it's much more difficult for them to justify both talking and fighting at the same time than it is for us. Uh, the, the Karzai government, the U.S., are fighting for representative government in Afghanistan, and the, and, the, and the people want a peace negotiation, and it's perfectly consistent with um, uh, the overall mission of both NATO and the Afghan government to give them what they want and to make a genuine uh, try. Um, I, I, I do think that there is a reasonable prospect that negotiations could succeed in delivering what I suggested was America's bottom line objective, which is to prevent Afghanistan from again becoming not just a sanctuary for al-Qaeda, but uh, an ally uh, with al-Qaeda, and that should be the, the bottom line objective of the United States in any such, uh, in, in any such negotiations. But negotiations can only succeed if they don't have to succeed. Uh, negotiations can only succeed if, uh, if uh, one has a viable alternative to success. Um, uh, and, and that means that in this case, the United States has to be preparing for two different futures. One in which negotiations succeed, and as a component of that negotiation, the US agrees to withdraw its forces. Um, and there are a number of other components of the agreement uh, as well. The alternative is uh, no success, um, uh, a, a situation in which the Afghan civil war continues more or less uh, indefinitely into the future. Um, and in order to achieve the US objective, um, the United States is going to have to be engaged to some extent. Uh, it's perfectly reasonable, coming back to the issue of costs, to, uh, uh, to do a cost-benefit analysis on Afghanistan and to determine that maybe the costs of preserving an Afghanistan that's not an ally with al-Qaeda um, is too high and that we'd be better off uh, uh, cutting our costs and accepting higher risks. Um, what's not really acceptable is to suggest, I think, that you can cut the costs and still not uh, in increase the risks. People have talked about moving from a counterterrorism, from a counterinsurgency to a counterterrorism strategy on the arguments that that would be much less resource intensive. But you can't conduct a counterterrorist strategy in Afghanistan if the country's uh, are governed by the Taliban. And that means that in order to conduct a counterterrorism strategy, somebody else has to win the counterinsurgency strategy. That is, they have to prevent the Taliban from taking over the government. So if you're more confident that Karzai can do a better job here than we can, fine, then advocate that we move only to counterterrorism. But if you have some doubts about that, then moving in a more deliberate pace, as indeed the administration intends, to transfer these responsibilities is, uh, is appropriate. So again, we need to prepare for two very different futures, and we need to make both of them credible. We need to make negotiations credible by making clear that we are prepared to withdraw uh, under the right conditions, and we need to make negotiations persuasive to the other side by making equally clear that we're prepared to stay. My role in this conference is sort of like Joel Gray in Cabaret, uh, to jump in whenever I need to, and Susan Glasser is wonderful. I want to just to say, um, as I neglect that, I want to one shower uh, with thanks and praise Christine Fair, uh, who's joining us from UC Berkeley. Uh, Christine is assistant professor at the Center for Peace and Security Studies at the Walsh School of Foreign Service at Georgetown, author of Drone Wars, the article, uh, very provocative and important, that recently appeared in Foreign Policy. I've been advised by our tech people, Christine, uh, that while you speak, which if Susan Glasser encourages you to do, while you're speaking, just turn that down the volume and it will cut down the feedback on your own computer. But um, now I turn it back to Susan. Do you want her to go now? Yeah, I'd like yeah. to be great. Yeah. Christine, we're looking forward uh, to hearing your thoughts as well on uh, what are actual realistic options for, for proceeding at this point. Can you hear us? Yeah, actually, is the audio okay? Because I hear there's just a lot of static um, on my connection. Can you turn down the volume? I'm trying to do that now. Is, is that better? A little bit more. A little bit more. Um, it might be us, so we're gonna we're gonna work on it. Is that okay? Okay. Yeah, sorry about that. I have I have this Jurassic netbook. It's I'm <laughs> surprised it even works. It's a little better than a carrier pigeon. Okay, we're so, good. Uh, we're good now. 
Okay, so we're good now. So, I, I mean, obviously I missed a good chunk of the portion because I was actually trying to sleep. So I'm, I have a little bit of concern that uh, some of my, my points might be redundant. And I don't know the extent to which you guys had already spoke uh, spoken about the Pakistan issue, but this has been one of my longstanding critiques of, 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 the, of expanding the counterinsurgency effort in Afghanistan has been because of the absolute impossibility of engaging Pakistan on this issue. In, in several uh, conversations over the last few weeks surrounding the Raymond Davis issue and Pasha's visit, you once again hear this discussion of the so-called trust deficit. And I have always been critical of this construction. I remain so. Because what strikes me is that this isn't a trust deficit. This is actually a certitude surplus. Right. <laughs> Sunnis understand that as we're trying to get an end state in Afghanistan figured out, that the space that we used to have to finagle important differences is really constricting. And so to put a fine point on that, our needs to go after the Haqqani network, obviously the, the Kuwaita Shura, which has now been relocated to Quorum, Karachi, and elsewhere, and Pakistan's desire and indeed requirement to maintain these assets are, are really coming into, into sharp conflict. And, you know, over the last 10 years or so, what we've, what we've largely done is we, we've tried to finesse this. That, yes, it's true that Pakistan and the United States, we have different strategic goals over some longer-term time horizon. But on issues, for example, like al-Qaeda, the Pakistanis are going to help us out. What has become increasingly clear over the last year or so is that Pakistan is trying to figure out a completely separate endgame in, in Afghanistan. Of course, they've always done this. But I think we, we, would, we would be behooved to try to understand what it is the Pakistanis are discerning. Because I think it, it does reflect some of the conversations I picked up on the last two minutes of the previous speaker. I think, is it, was that Jim Dobbins? Yes. yes. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it sounded like you, but all I see is some dude in a purple tie and a beard sitting in front of me. <laughs> so what, one thing I've, I've noticed... <laughs> No, she can't see us. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, dude. <laughs> One thing that I've, that I've noticed in the last year or so of my, of my several trips to Pakistan is that the Pakistanis themselves are very worried about the remnants of the so-called um, Afghan Taliban, right? So one of the consequences of U.S. and NATO successful efforts at eliminating these different levels of leadership is that they've had to be replaced very quickly. And, and the people that are coming in to fill those billets hate the ISI, quite frankly, as much as they hate us. You know, they have a different relationship with the ISI than, than the al-Qaeda commanders of 10 years ago. They, they see Pakistan's role in Afghanistan as being manipulative, serving Pakistan's interests, but not that of Afghans. And so the Pakistanis themselves are trying to figure out how do we regain the momentum uh, not the moment. How do we regain control over this organization that has has really evolved over the last ten years? Right, it's not the same organization that it was ten years ago. So the very fact that Pakistan itself is scrambling to figure out its own end state about this organization, you know, does strongly suggest that our strategies about thinking about the Taliban really need to change. And I I think fundamentally one of my biggest concerns about the expansion of the counterinsurgency effort really goes back to Pakistan, right? The more troops that we need to have on the ground there means that we're ever more dependent upon Pakistan, not less. And so these differences that were significant but somehow finessable over the last 10 years have become much more difficult to finesse. And I'd, I'd like to add that, of course, it's, it's no longer just, uh, you know, issues around al-Qaeda and the Taliban that we're very concerned about with Pakistan. We're also very concerned about Lashkar Taiba, right? I mean, this, I don't know how much you guys have, have talked about the multiple security concerns that we have situated there in Pakistan, but there is this enormous irony from my point of view that we've chosen a strategy that says we need to stabilize Afghanistan so we can stabilize Pakistan, but in fact, it's, it's just the opposite. Whatever happens in Afghanistan is going to be to a very significant degree overdetermined by Pakistan itself. Right? That's my view. Um, if you were to put your Pakistani goggles on for a second, since 9-11, its, its security equities have, have compromised more than they have been buckwist. So, for example, 
Under the U.S. security umbrella, the Indians have been able to develop a presence in Afghanistan that they weren't able to develop before we were there. And so this gives rise to some, I think, a big difference, a, a difference between what the Pakistanis say publicly and what they actually say privately. I know Kiani has said repeatedly, you need to have reassurance that you're going to be in Afghanistan in perpetuity. The White House somehow believes that by saying in Afghanistan, we're going to reassure the Pakistanis. It's actually just the opposite. You know, I've been working with the Pakistan Army for a very long time now and um, spent quite a bit of time with a lot of them over the summer. I'm going back this summer. What's absolutely clear is that no matter what Kiani says, this is the way that many people that I've interacted with, including folks at the major level, they want us out. And they want us out for the reason that I just said. The longer we stay, the longer the Indians can basically free ride under our security umbrella. When, in fact, they, they simply want the Indians gone. So you know, I see an, a huge number of discontinuities between our goals in Afghanistan and what we can accomplish when we consider what we're able to do with the Pakistanis. And, and I think at some point, this last decade, wishful thinking about how we can bring the Pakistanis on board to get them to under, you know, to, you know Seth Jones and I, a bunch of us have, have worked on how do you fundamentally reshape Pakistan's cost-benefit calculus around its current programs. And this, the approach the U.S. has adopted thus far, which is really about financial allurements, uh, strategic conventional weapon systems, none of these things are adequate to convince Pakistan that its current approach is anything but helpful. So I mean, at what point do we really have to reconsider what we want to do and what we can do in Afghanistan when we have a more realistic understanding of what Pakistan is and will be rather than the Pakistan that we aspire or or hope to obtain through these various allurements. And so, you know, going back to the theme of this, I, I, I've actually been a, a fairly strong proponent of this thing. I mean, a number of people have put it forward, Vice President Biden. I think there's a lot of merits to the counterterrorism plus notion. And I apologize that I didn't hear all of Dobbin's critique of it. But let me put out on the table why I think there's some advantages to this. Although, in some sense, this train sailed. You know, where we are where we are. By having a more uh, easily sustainable footprint in Afghanistan, where we're not completely dependent upon Pakistan for the GLOCs, where we're able to create a space, where we, can, we can play more, we, we can play a harder ball game with Pakistan than we can right now. I'm, I'm not convinced that we cannot continue to go after Al Qaeda without our counterinsurgency footprint for the following reasons. And we, we know that what's going on right now is a negotiation about a SOFA, a status of forces agreement. Karzai has no interest. And I can't imagine, uh, let, let's start from a fundamental assumption. I, I think it's a low probability event, given even the abysmal operational capacity of the ANSF, that a return to the Taliban central government is it, even realistic. I, I take this off the table. So if, if there's a genuine possibility of the Taliban coming back, then my analysis it, it is absolutely pointless. So I'm going to take as a given that we're not going to have, um, you know, Taliban 10.0, uh, you know, running the country from Kabul. So if we if we put that extreme out on the table, this is what I think could possibly work. Karzai has no interest in Al Qaeda coming back, and this we have we have fairly tightly aligned set of interests. Right? So we negotiate through the process of the SOFA access to a number of important military bases from which we can continue to prosecute the counterterrorism mission, focusing on Al Qaeda. Now, I don't know, you know how much you guys talked about this before, but I'm, I am very strongly of the view that no matter how horrible the Taliban are, there, there, there is such enormous variation in the Taliban that it's very hard for me to say that the Taliban are any worse than some of the, the savages that we've made as our allies. So I find the moral arguments against the Taliban to be thoroughly unconvincing. And given that so many Afghans are opposed to the counterinsurgency, I'm also not convinced that once or if we were to scale back a counterinsurgency footprint, that our intelligence doesn't actually improve. So one of the arguments for maintaining the status quo or even escalating the counterinsurgency footprint is the quality of intelligence. I, I think it's a fairly specious argument to say that through our current operations we're getting, you know, <laughs> excessively high quality intelligence. I just, I'm not persuaded by that. 
So, um, it, you know, just sort of in conclusion, in, in making the defense for the, counter the, the counterterrorism plus, by getting out of a footprint that Afghans themselves seem to find so odious, and finding some midpoint of tolerance with the Taliban, I think it's entirely possible that our intelligence on al-Qaeda actually improves. And, you know, just in closing, I think re realigning what our priorities in Afghanistan that focuses on al-Qaeda, not the Taliban, not only allows us to be in a less intense confrontation with Pakistan so that we can pursue our other objectives, which I think are far more important in Pakistan, frankly, than they are in Afghanistan, but ultimately this becomes much more uh, finessable in terms of money, lives, and the sorts of things that populations in Afghanistan, the United States, and Pakistan will, are willing to tolerate. Christine, thank you so much. I, uh, I know we can't see you, but uh, we are... We are very grateful for your provocative comments, and in fact, I, I'm, I'm hoping we can get as quickly as possible to a conversation among this great group. I'm going to ask Brian uh, to go next, and actually, Brian, if you could talk from the podium, I think that will be better for our, uh, our C-SPAN viewers. Um, but if we can keep it tight, we'll have more time uh, to debate and discuss as well as get your questions. Great. Thank you, Susan, and thank you, Stephen, and everybody who's uh, come here today, because I think this is a very important event. Uh, the first panel, I think, really punched above its weight. It had a lot of expertise, and, and, uh, but it, I think, offered new ideas about how we can address this challenge. And what um, Joshua Faust called the mal um, malarkey of tragic horses. Um, I, I see it as a, as a classic Humpty Dumpty problem. And I was thinking about this event this morning and thinking about all of the think tank reports that came out last fall in particular, including my organizations, the Center for New American Security, uh, a bipartisan commission on the Council on Foreign Relations Task Force, uh, all, New America's Af Afghanistan Study Group, and other. If you look at the broad contours of, of what's proposed in there, there, there's a lot that's quite similar uh, amongst those uh, recommendations, uh, and, and a lot that's not new. And what I hope this conversation, I think, does is pushes us forward uh, in this policy challenge that I think this administration is, is wrestling with. Um, but it's clear to me at this stage, nearly 10 years into this war, we still lack a coherent strategy. We still lack a coherent strategy that uh, sticks together. And I was thinking about this and why is this the case? And at the risk of being pedantic before I get to the where do we go from here, I think it's important, and I do this a lot in meetings in the government too, what is a strategy? It includes a statement of objectives and desired ends. Those ends need to be realistic and achievable and well-defined. There needs to be ways and means designed to achieve those ends. They need to be prioritized in importance. And the roles of responsibilities of key players in executing those ways and means must be clearly defined. That, that's a very basic, I think, definition that we often uh, miss inside of government and also in the think tank community where we have the luxury of thinking about things uh, as opposed to doing and clearing the inbox of those in, inside the uh, government. I think there are three main reasons as to why 10 years into a war we still lack a strategy. And this is very basic, but I think it's important to think about and maybe provoke new thinking on this. Number one, there's a multiplicity of actors that have a stake in the outcome. Christine's uh, comments just talked about this, uh, looking at it from the Pakistani perspective as opposed to ours. But number one, there's a number of different actors that have different interests, and we need to digest that here inside the Beltway, understand that, yes, our interests matter, have a clearly defined goal uh, for those, to advance those interests, but others are operating in that way. We, we quite often don't do that. We, we quite often don't map out what are the strategic interests of uh, other actors. We often don't know in, in some cases because of the opaqueness uh, of this. Number two, there's a wide range of complicated actions that each of these actors are undertaking. So to assess what's going on, I think uh, y y you get a sense of complexity. And, 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 and you understand why we're in somewhat of a quagmire. Number three, and I think this is important for the DC discussion, there is a considerable gap between America's impression of itself and our capacity to achieve stated outcomes. And it's not only in Afghanistan or Pakistan, I work on the Middle East also, and nearly for the last decade or so, we have had presidents of the United States, President Bush and now President Obama, declare certain outcomes they want to achieve, and then we don't achieve them. And it has created uh, what I call an efficacy crisis. And this debate about the decline of American power, which I don't completely accept, because I actually think there's something deeper going on. I think that the nature of power 
in the international arena is actually changing. What it means to actually get what you want done. And that there's a multiplicity of actors that can shape that. And people have written about this more theoretically. That said, what do we do on Afghanistan? Six quick things, and I'm going to go through very quickly, I hope. Number one, I actually think we need to continue to question counterinsurgency doctrine, which has continued to dominate a lot of our decisions. We did this yesterday in a great discussion with John Noggle at CNAS over at the Center for American Progress yesterday. It's my view that the doctrine has important elements and principles that can be applied in certain situations, but we need to stop thinking about it like a strategy. And I know I'm going to get tweets and angry blogs just for stating this, because it's almost become like a dogma. And if you question it, it's uh, really, you're like questioning a, a religion. But the long war, as it's called, and counterinsurgency aspires to be like containment and deterrence was in the Cold War. It cannot be thus, because the seeds of a counterinsurgency strategy applied globally are, uh, it destroys itself essentially. It is not sustainable for a number of reasons. Number one, large number of troops are not cost effective. Richard talked about that before. Number two, the presence of foreign troops quite, quite often creates security challenges that didn't exist before. It inflames local populations. Number three, I think we see this, there's a potential legitimacy crisis of political actors that we seek to support in counterinsurgency strategies. And then number four, uh, this is the thing that concerns me the most, most. it erodes potentially US will to project its power in the world in different ways. That I, I believe we need to be a, a global leader, but I think we're eroding the political will on Capitol Hill to use resources to remain a global power. So number one, we need to question that. Number two, I think we need to have a goal, a clearly defined goal. Disrupt, dismantle, defeat Al-Qaeda and Afghanistan and Pakistan is the goal as articulated by the president. That is fine as far as it goes in terms of trying to marshal public domestic political support. Um, but I think it also doesn't get us to much clarity in terms of what we're trying to build and achieve on the ground. I state the goal often as uh, uh, a stable and peaceful region of the world, South Asia, that is much more integrated with itself and uh, economically, politically, culturally. You need to have a broad goal like that uh, and state it proactively as opposed to in the, in the negative, which our current goal is to disrupt, dismantle, defeat Al-Qaeda without defining what are the conditions that we need to get there. Two. I think we need to identify that which we're going to do and that which what we're not going to do. I need, we need to check our American exceptionalism at the door in a sense. And this is going to be the hardest thing to do. And I'm trying to be a little bit provocative here. But we can't do it all. It, that runs against the grain of American culture. But we simply cannot do that uh, a lot of things. And we're, we're going to keep running in circles, I think, in Afghanistan if we don't recognize that. The last three things. We need to identify the... Uh, not only the interests of actors, but what they can do and what they're already doing. I think James in the last panel talked about statecraft. There are many faces here who have decades of experience who are engaged in statecraft and understand this. Uh, Ambassador Dobbins, uh, Ambassador Pickering, who was here before. Understanding uh, what, what I've talked about and Steve mentioned, that getting others to paint the fence for you, getting others to pull their weight, understanding what their interests and what they're doing right now to achieve that which you want to achieve. Because right now, it's all about us, and we're, a, a good bit of it, we're, we're bearing the burden. And I don't think we fully understand and how, how to disentangle ourselves. Number five, we need to identify multiple means to achieve those goals and not simply be focused on troop levels. And again, we're going to go into another round of debate here. And I'm sure it's going to be about the slope of the pace of withdrawal of U.S. troops. That's an important debate. But the thing that frustrated me in the fall of 2009 when I came back from Afghanistan is that there was insufficient debate about the political and economic means uh, that are available, uh, not only to the United States, but to other countries. People haven't noticed the, the, the Defense Authorization Act, Ike Skelton, 2011. Not many people notice this, even in the policy discussion. It actually requires the President of the United States and the Pentagon and the State Department to produce a viable economic plan for Afghanistan that is sustainable. We in the think tank, I, I, was, I was doing a poll of uh, think tankers. They don't know, a lot of people don't know that. People on the inside need help with that. Uh, this is one of the multiple means. And then lastly, I think we need, this is probably the most controversial thing, we probably need a healthy dose of strategic ambiguity and flexibility in our own policy. This is anathema, I think, to a lot of people who want certainty. They want a deadline to get out, or they want to stay for indefinitely in a long-term agreement. And here I'll only highlight two very specific things. Christine briefly mentioned this. I think it's quite foolish at this point for President Karzai uh, to have the impression that we need a strategic framework agreement, strategic partnership agreement, more than he needs it. 
And I think that's the impression that our current action is leaving right now. Uh, with all due respect to President Karzai and his government, he is the leader of a relatively weak, poor, and corrupt government, and he has run circles around us for five or six years. And we've allowed him to do that, our own actions, our own sort of American exceptionalism, we've got to get it right, the sunk costs, yada, yada, yada. Uh, number two, on Pakistan, I, it, it, what was the phrase? Uh, uh, the certitude su surplus, that's brilliant, uh, Christine. It's really, really important. I think at a certain point, there is a great deal of utility uh, in having a strategy that has some elements of strategic ambiguity that leave some questions in the minds because oftentimes our debate in the Beltway is how do we reassure everybody? How do we reassure everybody that we're going to be with them in the long run? And what I'm saying is that we've got a considerable amount of power that is in a way like judo or jujitsu used against us, like a, 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 the weapons, uh, the resources that we're using to try to achieve certain ends because we are so bullish about trying to get to where we want to go without thinking about what others can do to paint the fence for us. So I know I went over, but I hope that sparks some new thinking. I have some specifics in the questions and answers, but I look forward to the other respondents uh, on the panel. Thank you. Excellent. Brian, thanks so much. I can see, uh, but by the end of this, we're going to have to be taking a, a, a vote here on uh, counterinsurgency and whether it's actually a religion or not. Um, <laughs> Peter, uh, I think we're we're very much looking forward to your uh, sense in injecting also a little bit of your thoughts about what's really realistic in terms of what we're talking about here, uh, in terms of the U.S. military's footprint in Afghanistan. Is it going to be changing in the foreseeable future? How much of this is continuing a conversation that, that we've actually been having for, for quite some time? Thank you, Susan, and thank you, uh, Steve Clemens, and, and for the invitation and, uh, to be on this great panel. Just a few factual points uh, about some things that have been said earlier today. In terms of a cost-benefit ratio, at the height of the Vietnam War, the United, spent, the United States spent 9.5% of its GDP on the military. Right now, we're spending 1% of our GDP in Afghanistan. So we weren't attacked from Afghanistan, from Vietnam. We were attacked from Afghanistan. I think the money's worth it. And of course, the money will go down as we draw down. In a $15 trillion economy, $118 billion or whatever it is is a serious amount of money, but it's not really a game changer in terms of our debt and other issues. In terms of painting the fence uh, that Brian mentioned, there are 46 countries in Afghanistan as part of a coalition. And in fact, British and Canadian and Danish troops have died at a proportionately higher rate uh, if you adjust for population than, is, than for Americans. I wanted to uh, sort of attach myself to many of the points that Jim Dobbins made in terms of the data. But, and there's one data point that I, I'd like to add to that, which is you're more likely to be murdered in Washington, D.C. today than you are to be killed in the Afghan war. The war in Afghanistan simply isn't that violent, by, certainly by Afghan historical standards, and by absolute standards. You're six times more likely to be killed in New Orleans uh, murdered in New Orleans today than you ought to be killed in the war in Afghanistan where uh, 2,800 civilians died last year. But it's, uh, uh, when you adjust it for population, you're still, as, as Jim mentioned, more likely to be killed in Iraq. And one final point on the counterterrorism coin debate. We've already tried the counterterrorism approach and it was found wanting. And the whole point about where we are today is we did, it, we did this whole exercise on the cheap. As Jim Dobbins and others at RAND pointed out, in the first years of the Afghan project, we spent... Uh, roughly a 30th of what we spent in Bosnia after the conflict there per capita, and about an 18th of what we spent in Kosovo. Uh, so, you know, we did it on the cheap, and that's why we're here today having this conversation. Why are we there is an interesting question. I think the president has made a mistake, a very understandable one, about narrowly defining it just about al-Qaeda, which, of course, from a political view, makes a lot of sense, because which American wants al-Qaeda to be back in Afghanistan? The answer is none. But there are some other reasons, one of which is a very unrealistic one in, in foreign policy terms, which I think, and many Afghans think, that we have sort of a moral obligation to get it right in Afghanistan, by right, a somewhat stable state, a somewhat OK army, uh, before we leave. Uh, and I think that's a reasonable thing for us to consider now that we've overthrown their government. And it's not just al-Qaeda we need, be, need to be concerned about. When Afghanistan was ruled by the Taliban, every Muslim insurgent terrorist group in the world was either headquartered there or had a significant presence there. So just to define it merely as al-Qaeda is not enough. Fine, and, and then as, as Brian pointed out, a stable South Asia is surely a part of this picture. And finally, the Taliban are the Taliban. 
You know, the idea that somehow these are going to turn into sort of a group of Henry Kissingers over time, I think is just ludicrous. We've run a controlled experiment on this issue for years in Pakistan. In Pakistan, in SWAT, just two years ago, they beheaded the policemen, they burned down the girls' schools, they imposed a reign of terror. That's the Taliban. The Taliban don't recognize the border between Pakistan and Afghanistan. The Haqqani network today is hosting not just al-Qaeda, but Lashkar-e Taiba, the Islamic movement of Uzbekistan, the Islamic Jihad Union. I can give you a whole multiple set of three-letter jihadist groups that are now located inside the Haqqani network. This is who they are. And what are they doing in Afghanistan? Seven, as Jim mentioned, 2,800 civilians were killed last year, 75% by the Taliban. There's been a consistent campaign, by the way, not very well covered in the American press, in my view, of chemical weapons attacks against girls' schools, which have happened all over the country in Afghanistan, more than a dozen cases. So that is the Taliban. That said, of course, we do want to reconcile with people, even, that we, even people we find to be uh, you know, morally objectionable in one way or another. But the problem, there are several problems with reconciliation. I just want to tick off very rapidly. One is we're 10 years into this. The moderate Taliban have already, already reconciled. The people we call, keep talking about, Mullah Zaif, Mutawakil, all these people, they're, they're not part of the Taliban that we're fighting. They're already reconciled. Secondly, Mullah Omar is a religious fanatic, and the history of successful negotiations with, with the religious fanatic is not encouraging. He calls himself the commander of the faithful, which is a rarely invoked religious title, uh, indicating that he's not just the leader of the Taliban, but the leader of all Muslims. This is not somebody that I think you can easily do business with, and he's taken every opportunity to say that he's not interested in negotiation or compromise. They haven't, they've had 10 years to reject al-Qaeda and all those works. It's never happened. They could they always say 9-11 was a mistake or this guy bin Laden was bad for us or whatever. They've said nothing like this. Um, the history of peace deals with the Taliban is not encouraging. We've had multiple peace deals with them in Pakistan, in Waziristan in 05 and 06, in Swat in 09. They reneged on every peace deal and they took it as an opportunity to regroup and grab more territory. Mullah Bereda. Uh, and his seizure by the Pakistanis indicates the Pakistanis have a veto over these negotiations. Um, that's not necessarily a bad thing. They have legitimate interests in Afghanistan, but this is not a typical negotiation. We have governments and insurgents. We also have now Pakistan sitting at the table. And of course, we also have now the Northern Alliance sitting at the table. The people, two of the most powerful men in Afghanistan spent years fighting the Taliban. Uh, Bismillah Khan, the head of the Ministry of Interior, Dr. Abdullah, who is very likely at this moment to be the next president of Afghanistan. Do you think they want to deal with a Taliban that gives them significant territory or compromises on significant principles? The answer is, of course, no. We've seen the negotiations in Mecca and Maldives have basically been performance art operations that have achieved absolutely nothing. Uh, we saw with the debacle with Mullah Mansour, the supposed leader of the Taliban, who was negotiating with the, directly with the Karzai government, who turned out to be a quite, a, quite a shopkeeper, making quite a lot of money based on his being an imposter, uh, that we're very foggy about who we're dealing with. We, don't, we just simply don't know. Finally, and this is really the nub of it, what do the Taliban want? And the insurgency says is a very common problem. The insurgents know what they don't want. They want the international forces out. But what, are they, what vision of Afghanistan do they really see? Does it include democracy? Does it include elections? Does it include women working? Does it include girls going to school? I think you actually know the answer to most of, the answer of those questions. And the answer is no, that is not what it includes. And they've never made that clear uh, because it would be a problem for them, I think, in terms of these negotiations. That said, negotiations are the way forward, of course, and they have multiple potential uh, advantages. One is, of course, you create splits in the insurgency. So Hezbi Islami might do a deal, for instance. They're the lowest hanging fruit. That's a good thing because it shows the Taliban are not united. It sows dissension in the ranks of the Taliban. That's a good thing. It provides information about well, the, this very opaque movement. That's a good thing. And as finally, as Jim said, it, it allows the, it, it takes away the moral high ground from the Taliban. They're not, now they're not involved in a holy, holy war. They're actually involved in a political process and they may become more uh, sort of responsible. And my final point on this is Audrey Cronin has done some very interesting work about what are the preconditions for insurgents or terrorists to come to, to, come to a peace deal. And I'm just going to give you four of them and think about how they operate in Afghanistan uh, going forward. One is a mutual recognition of a military stalemate. This is a very common now, if we'd had this conversation a year ago, I would have said that wasn't looking very good. But I, actually, now it's a little bit better. The Taliban have had some uh, military defeats in Kandahar and Helmand. American and Western publics are fed up with this war that's already the longest in American history. So maybe there is a bit of there is a mutual recognition of some form of stalemate. Strong leadership on both sides of the equation. Mullah Omar and Hamid Karzai don't fit, fit either of these. Mullah Omar is in control of, the, of even the, the, the insurgency in southern Afghanistan. So that that's a negative. Uh, trusted third-party sponsors are quite important. 
Uh, here, the Saudis initially were involved, but I think you know, for them, after all, what is Al-Qaeda's principal goal? It's the overthrow of the Saudi monarchy. So if the Taliban don't reject Al-Qaeda and all its works, the Saudis are not going to be involved further. The Pakistanis are not uh, trusted by any party, as Christine said. They're not even trusted by the Taliban. Um, and so that's a problem. The United Nations might be a venue, and of course, uh, Tom Pickering was here earlier, and Jim worked on the task force, and the task force suggests that the UN might be a good, good a way of going forward, and it might be. However, a big caveat, the Taliban the Taliban have attacked a number of UN uh, officers and personnel in the last year, uh, suggesting that they may not share the same view. Uh, finally, the Turkey office opening sounds like a, a good thing in, in, on that level. And just one final point ending on a slightly more optimistic note, the political context is very important. 74% of Afghans are in favor of negotiations. That number goes up to 94% in Kandahar. So there is a great, even though that only less than one in 10 Afghans have a favorable view of the Taliban, there is a great political appetite to do a deal with them. And that is really the, the main optimistic thing I can say uh, on this issue. Matthew? Okay, well, thank you for everyone for coming today, particularly on short notice. Um, if you work with Steve, you learn to take a breath, and it's going to work out. Um, so I appreciate everyone coming. And, 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 you know, being the tenth of ten panelists, you know, you end up uh, just constantly changing your notes to try and keep up with everyone. And, and I think it's been a great, uh, great morning uh, so far. Uh, just to respond back uh, to Peter's a couple of Peter's points real quick, um, you know, the, the issue of GDP and how much we're spending um, it's true in terms of how much of GDP we spend on our military, but if you look at all, overall at our government spending, this comes to an issue of priorities for us. We're spending so much more on our military than everything else. I think Ezra Klein from the Washington Post had that great comment last week or two weeks ago where he said, the U.S. government is turning into an insurance company with an army. So it's a question of not necessarily, you know, <laughs> apples to apples here, but a, question of, a general question of what are our priorities, okay, um, if we're willing to spend uh, – you know, to build an Afghan security force of 400,000 in Afghanistan, but we're cutting cops in nearly every municipality across the United States. It's a question of priorities. Um, with regards to both Ambassador Dobbins' comments and uh, uh, Peter's about the relationship between Al Qaeda and Taliban, which tends to be the issue that most folks on Capitol Hill have when it comes to doing something different in Afghanistan, um, I think that relationship is pretty nebulous. Um, who was the guy who brought bin Laden to Afghanistan in the first place? A guy named Abdul Sayyaf. Who's Abdul Sayyaf? He was the guy that Karzai wanted to be Speaker of the Parliament. So this notion that there's some clear connection between the entire insurgency and Al-Qaeda is just it's not the case. And while there are elements of the Taliban that are connected with, with Al-Qaeda, why do we lump it all together? And this brings me really to my first point about where we're at right now. And we're in a stalemate. And the metrics, the indicators, the cell phones, the number of schools open, et cetera, I don't doubt that. The public opinion numbers do not doubt that at all. Because it reminds me so much of Iraq in 2004, 2005, 2006. Um, when I was in Iraq in 2004, 2005, into Crete, mortar and rocker daily, IEDs all over the place small arms amb ambushes, half day's drive. I can go to Sulmania, though, in Kurdistan, eat in a restaurant, sleep in a hotel. You know what I mean? So there's different metrics, different indicators for different parts of the country, and you have to understand the conflict in that, in that way. Uh, additionally, when I came home, worked on the Iraq desk at State, same thing, too. Every week I worked on what's called the weekly status report. Put out information that shows we're winning. And then I worked on what's called the national strategy for victory in Iraq. Not the same wording but very similar language to what we're using right now in Afghanistan. So when you look at what are the actual key metrics, the key data points, the actual indicators of conflict, size of the insurgency, and one of the things that we should be careful of is rather than using Taliban, use the word insurgency, because when we say Taliban, we lump them all together under that white banner, which is not entirely appropriate, or not appropriate at all in many cases. So when you look at the, the, the key met size and certainty, political support for the Karzai government, 10 million people voted in the first election, 3 million people voted in this last election. Uh, you look at IEDs, assassinations, number of Southerners joining the Afghan National Army, last numbers coming out of our government, 0.6% of Afghan Army recruits were Southern Pashtuns. 
Okay, you have a very serious problem there. Uh, and then American casualties. We've had 21 killed this month. We only had 20 killed previous April, which is higher than the previous April, et cetera. All the trends are going the wrong way. So I don't see the evidence to support progress. And again, it reminds me of the statements we made in 04, 05, 06. So um, the Afghanistan study group, we have our uh, recommendations on where we should go. Um, it's in the uh, handout we provide here as well as online. But I also encourage you all to read uh, the Century Foundation's report as well as Brian's organization's report uh, from Center for American Progress. Um, CNAS has done reports, CFR has done reports, and you'll see that most people out there are advocating for a change. Okay, and one of the things I just want to discuss briefly, let's talk about the one aspect that we, 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 we recommend in terms of political efforts and reconciliation. And when we say political efforts, you can't walk into somebody in this town who doesn't say it's a political solution to this conflict, but we're not doing it. Okay, so we actually have to change our policies. When I was there and we received our, our operational order from General McChrystal, there was nothing in there instructing us to do political efforts. There's nothing in there saying, speak to the insurgency and find out what their grievances are. Find out why these people who weren't supporting the insurgency last year are now supporting the insurgency this year. Until we do those kinds of things, we won't have any success at negotiations. And negotiations have to occur at that local level. So you have to have your battalion commanders and your brigade commanders doing those things. But needs to occur at regional and national levels as well. And then, of course, ultimately, some type of international settlement with regards to Afghanistan that guarantees its neutrality. But the other aspect of this is that we have to push for political reforms. Okay, if we look at Afghanistan 2001 as a civil war that we intervened in and took one side out of power and put the other side in power, but then imposed a, a political system that just reinforced victory for one side, we have to amend that. And the problem is, is in Afghanistan, there's not just two sides in this conflict. It's probably about 100 a thousand. It, 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 it's, it's very, very difficult, extremely multi-layered, extremely complex. So if you look at the fact that the process we have now marginalizes and disenfranchises many elements of Afghan society and pushes them to uncertainty, just in many ways our policies in Iraq did by marginalizing and disenfranchising the Sunnis and pushing them to the Sunni insurgency, we realize that what we've been doing is giving the Afghans two choices, and they're both bad choices. You can either support the Taliban, or you can support this Karzai government made up of your traditional rivals that is corrupt, predatory, and illegitimate. And so they're both very bad choices. So until we have a policy that recognizes that, recognizes that right now we're acting as a belligerent in the conflict, we're just participating in the conflict, we're taking one side, we're stuck in the, the whether it's the conflict is on ethnic, regional, uh, economic, whether it's basically between the Hatfields and McCoys and we're propping up and making the Hatfields rich, you know, at the expense of the McCoys. Until we recognize that and amend our policy to actually be more in the role of being an arbitrator or a mediator, this conflict will continue to be in a stalemate. Because when you go and you meet with the royal postunes who are supporting the Taliban, they look at you and they talk to you and we've been fighting for 30 years. We're tired, but we're not going to surrender. And who am I standing with when they say that to you? And this happened both in the East and South. You're standing, with, you're standing with a Tajik army commander who fought for the communists. In the South, I was standing with a, 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 a postulant intelligence officer who had been part of CAD, the Afghan intelligence service. I mean, so you're standing up there with these people's traditional rivals. And you're saying, this is your government. Embrace it. So until we recognize what we're doing and what role we're playing in the conflict, and then seek to amend that process to be one, again, of an arbiter or a mediator, we won't see that necessary negotiations that leads to stability, uh, not just in Afghanistan, but ultimately in Pakistan. But I appreciate everyone's time. Uh, thank you for coming. I look forward to the conversation. Matthew, thank you so much. I think in, in a lot of ways you sort of crystallized the conversation uh, that we can be having because one of the things I'd like to throw back at our panelists, including Christine, is, is what you left us with, which is, is there a consensus on this group that a policy change is what we're talking about on the part of the United States in order to get to a state of political settlement or political negotiations? 
have we are we actually talking about reopening the Washington policy debate? And Brian, I, I want to come to you on that one, for example. Clearly, you, you have a point of view on counterinsurgency. Is that actually stopping us from uh, getting to real political negotiations? First, yeah. Mike's working. There we go. Um, first, uh, I would say that we are moving through a period of change in policy no matter what. I mean, and, and the, the president has defined it as such that July 2011 starts the uh, transition. Now, here's the problem. They haven't defined what transition actually means in very clear metrics in a sense. There's a goal that was stated at the uh, International Conference last fall. Hand over security responsibilities to Afghans by 2014. Between that goal and where we're at right now are a whole range of other things that actually are ill-defined by people I know inside the government who don't know how to define certain key metrics on the security governance and economic development front. Hence the need for things like the Ike Skelton Act that demands a re report from the, 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 the administration. So yes, we're in a period of change. We need the change. There's an impulse that's out there. It's recognized on the inside. Um, um, so certainly, yes, there's change. Second, on counterinsurgency, I mean, look, there's a certain view that we're, we're actually not doing counterinsurgency in Afghanistan if you look at it from its textbook sort of application. And nor could we ever really do it in a country like Afghanistan. We don't have the force levels that are required uh, of doing that. And then, you know, one thing I would stress also, if we were doing it and we were measuring it by the key metric of counterinsurgency, which is population protection, the people, uh, uh, the people are safe. 2010 turns out to be the deadliest year for the Afghan people uh, compared to all of the other years we've been there. Now, I should note that the vast majority of those deaths are at the hands of the insurgency. Um, but part of the problem, I think, and I would close and answer your question, Susan, is the question of sustainability in a period of transition and what we leave behind is a question that is, remains unanswered because of the problems that have been identified from the get-go at the start of the Obama administration and well before it. Pakistan and weak governance and corruption within our Afghan uh, uh, partners in the Afghan government. Those sorts of things imply to me that when the historians write the history of what the McChrystal surge and what was decided in 2009 to 2010, it all depends on how things end up. But if you, ha if you knew going in that those were weak pillars and that they needed to be integrated, then why commit the resources to build, to clear areas, as, as President Obama said, don't clear areas that you can't hold and that you can't transition. I'm afraid we've done that. And now the question is, now what? Some people, you know, counterinsurgency theorists would like you to say, okay, we've made these gains, so we don't want to lose those gains over the last year and a half. Certainly there's been security gains in the southern part of Afghanistan. But it gets us in this self-perpetuating cycle that when you step back to the strategic level that Richard wants you to get at, you really lose sight of what the hell we're doing. And, and I think, yes, we're moving through a change, but we need greater clarity of purpose of what we're actually trying to get done beyond disrupt, dismantle, defeat al-Qaeda in Afghanistan and Pakistan. Mm -hmm. do you, Ambassador Damas, do, do you think we're just talking about talking at this point? Or um, you know, do we need to have a whole new Washington process in order to be able to have a serious uh, political conversation? I mean, I think that the, contrary to Brian, I mean, I think the administration's uh, intentions are, are fairly clear. Brian has called for a, a, more, a clearer strategy, which should also be more ambiguous. I'm not sure how we quite achieve we can talk about that. both yeah. aspects of that. But, um, but uh, I mean, the administration um, uh, has set out the broad objective, which I've already talked about, which is a fairly simple one, um, which is denying Afghanistan as a, as a, as a sanctuary and, a, and an ally with international terrorists. It's uh, said it's, uh, it's going to begin scaling back uh, American combat forces with a view to turning full combat responsibility for combat over to the Afghans by 2014. It said it's prepared to stay beyond that in uh, a military as well as a civilian capacity to provide uh, non-combat assistance to Afghan forces. It said in a speech that President uh, Secretary Clinton gave on February 18th at the Asia Society that it wants to begin a negotiation, uh, that it has no preconditions for that negotiation, that its objectives of uh, having the Taliban cut its ties with Al Qaeda, accept the Constitution, and lay down their arms are not preconditions. Their objectives for the negotiation itself. Um, so, I mean, I think all of these things are easier to say than they are to carry out. 
um, uh, and uh, uh, I think they're particularly complicated in a multilateral uh, setting uh, in a place as, as distant and inaccessible as Afghanistan. But I don't think there's any lack of clarity in what the administration hopes to achieve and the instruments that it's uh, dedicated to achieving it. Mm -hmm. Just quickly, the strategic yeah. ambiguity. What, yeah, what and, and, and I think that? the comment is relevant in the chuckles that elicited because it demonstrates the problem with how we think about strategy. Because you can have a clear strategy which has ways and means and tactics that have flexibility built into them that demand more of others, of partners. And in fact, you know, I, we, we talked a little bit about Libya in the first panel, but I think this is also kind of what the Obama administration is trying to do. They have a clearly articulated goal. Uh, of its strategy. I don't necessarily agree with it, but there are, there's a flexibility in the strategy that's inherent and it demands more of others. And we don't have that at this point. I think um, I would disagree. You know, I think if we are focusing on the disrupt, dismantle, defeat Al-Qaeda, we've not answered that question that my boss, John Podesta, asked of Richard Holbrook two summers ago. Of, well, then what does this mean in terms of what we need to leave behind? Uh, what is our stated end objectives? And if you look at all of the strategy documents, at least publicly, that are produced, it's really still unclear in Afghanistan in terms of what we're, what's the cost to completion and what are we going to demand of others. And then I think we're really uh, at a loss when it comes to Pakistan. Just quickly, Christine, I want you to weigh in, if you could, on uh, negotiations. You said, well, some of the allies that we've been fighting with in Afghanistan or as bad or worse than the Taliban, quote unquote. Do you believe that some of, some of arguments have been made here that uh, there's no real partners for the U.S. in a meaningful uh, negotiated settlement? Where do you come down on that? Okay, I have, to, I have to confess with all the background, I heard about one in three words of what's been said in the last 10 minutes. So t tell us just quickly about uh, your views on whether it's possible to negotiate with the Taliban right now. Um, possible for whom to negotiate with the Taliban? Well, good question. Who, who did you have in mind? <laughs> well, I, well, look, I, I mean, everyone's negotiating with the Taliban. I mean, this isn't new. I mean, there have been discussions ongoing with different elements of the Taliban ever since the, the latter days of 2001 and the earlier days of 2002. So, I mean, it, it's absolutely possible because virtually everyone is doing it. Pakistan's doing it. Karzai has been doing it. We've made various efforts to do it. So I don't, I don't think the issue of, of negotiation is the issue. I think it's the terms of the negotiation. Uh, what are the expectations, how enforceable they are, and what's the symmetry of those expectations? And so I, I think it's entirely possible, but it, it really is a question of what is the desired end state from this? I mean, for example, the Pakistanis, as I'm sure all of you know, um, have been very apprehensive about uh, what some of the, the erstwhile Quetta Shura folks were trying to do vis-a-vis -vis Karzai, and they were rapidly trying to undermine that, trying to put into place um, actors that would act on behalf of Pakistan's interests. So I, I think the problem is there's a lot of negotiation going on, but it's, it's really happening in a way that is self-utility maximizing for those particular actors. And I think, and, and there's a good reason for that. Um, Pakistan is going to have a very distinct set of equities because of geography. And the kinds of things that we would be interested in, um, sort of maximalist positions about, I mean, I, I mean, I hate to say this, but I've, I've grown really frustrated with some of the gender and human rights issues. I mean, when no one has any rights, I'm not sure how we could be talking about protecting baseline women's rights. And I say that as a full ovulator, I'm, I'm frustrated with this tenor of the discussion. Christine, thank you so, so much. I, I think it's not a question of whether or not uh, uh, some kind of negotiations can go forward. Everyone's doing it. I, I think the issue is what's the basis of those discussions and what are the desired end states. And this is where all of, all of Afghanistan's near and far our neighbors are sort of like the hyena hopping on the Afghanistan carcass trying to secure their own interests. I think that is where the, some of the, the issues lie. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. I think that's an important point. I want to make sure we get time for questions. We have a, a very full house here today. We have a microphone here in the back. I'll ask you to stand up and identify yourself uh, and keep it short uh, so we can get as many as possible here. I think we have uh, one in the back to start. Thank you, Gary Thomas, VOA News. Uh, you know, in 1992, uh, the Mujahideen took Kabul. They deposed Najibullah, which, of course, led to the advent of the Taliban. And at that time, the international community 
wash its hands of Afghanistan and the United States started enforcing the Pressler Amendment on Pakistan for its nuclear program. I'm wondering how much, you know, uh, guilt is playing, perhaps is the word, into the U.S. determination to, quote, get it right, as Peter alluded to, in Afghanistan and Pakistan, and how much Pakistan's anger or re uh, residual uh, distrust of the United States uh, is also playing into this. How much does this affect the, the uh, picture that's going on now? Is, is this still hang on after after the all these years yeah. peter that can i take point. this actually can i take this issue sure sure christine yeah I, i'll be very brief this pressler amendment is a canard the folks that bring out this pressler amendment issue are absolutely not conversant with its history we first sanctioned pakistan for non-proliferation for, for proliferation concerns in april of 1979, April, long before December 79. For, from the time that the U.S. decided it would arm Pakistan, it had to provide equipment to Pakistan based on a presidential waiver until the 1985 Pressler Amendment was passed. The Pressler Amendment was passed not to punish Pakistan. In fact, the Pressler Amendment was negotiated with Pakistan's Ministry of Foreign Affairs to allow us to arm them while they continued to proliferate. So Pakistan full, fully understood what the Presser Amendment was about. It was a gentleman's agreement that we will arm you while you proliferate until we no longer need to arm you. So this has become an article of fact, um, a, a sort of ossified fiction, if you will, that is used to beat the United States up and to create this narrative that we are an unreliable partner. They had from April of 79 to the, the time we actually pulled the sanctions in in 89 to appreciate what our policy was about. So this is not the basis of the U.S.-Pakistan discord. They understood full well. The problem with the Pakistan-U.S. discord is that we will enter into these partnerships um, under the umbrella of a specific purpose. But Pakistan is signing up to the U.S., uh, signing up for, with the U.S. to serve its own purposes which are not those that the U.S. had expected. That's the problem. This is true when it signed up with Cito Cento in, in 1955. It's true in 1979, and it was true today. They've joined up with us to pursue their own interests vis-a-vis India. And what will typically happen in these periods, it takes like five years before the Americans to figure out <laughs> that we're not playing the same game. And that's kind of where we are right now. We, we, we understand where we are. We, we are trying to pretend that we have a strategic relationship when our strategic interests are orthogonal. It has nothing to do with Pressler. That is a huge canard. Okay. Thank you for that. Uh, does anyone have a different point of view on that? Uh, or should we, uh, let's jump to the next question then. Here we go. I think one of the reasons why the U.S. foreign policy establishment is incapable of comprehending what's going on in this region is methodological and epistemological. For example, the idea of polling in Afghanistan is completely meaningless, and studies have shown that people in that part of the world will rarely tell you what they think because they have a complex range of calculations that prevents them from doing so. In neighboring Pakistan, uh, there's been consistent polling, which finds uh, consistently that Pakistan is probably one of the most anti-American countries in the world, and I believe that polling. Why, therefore, would polling in neighboring Afghanistan be less believable? I don't get it. Um, the fa as Jim pointed out, 63% of Afghans have a favorable view of the U.S. military, which is an astonishing number. It's gone down from about 85%. Go across the border in Pakistan, only about typically 19, 20% have a favorable view of the United States. I'm not saying these numbers are exactly right, but they're broadly accurate. Let me just, let me just say that the opinion polling uh, tracks almost perfectly the election results. Okay? Now, I, I mean, you know, it, it's a question about whether one's, you know, prepared to accept a anecdote as the only basis for forming one's opinion or whether one's going to go to something that's a little more systematic. Further, the polling I, I, I cited is not the product of a single poll, but of 25 polls conducted over a five-year period, all of which tracked and showed similar opinion trends. Now, the absolute numbers may be slightly off. There is a margin of error. 
But if the number is going up over time, then it's probably true that sentiment is going up in that direction, even if the totals may be slightly off. And similarly, if, if it's going down. Can make a point, Susan? Sure. Um, yeah, I, I don't disagree. And I have my disagreements with, with the ambassador and with Brian. And I don't disagree on the public opinion numbers. And I agree, yes, 63% support the American presence. 37% are violently opposed. And that's what we have to understand. There's another side to the conflict. There's another side to the poll. Um, I do agree with you, though, in terms of how we conduct our foreign policy. Uh, just as an anecdote, I, a friend of mine sent me an announcement for a desk position uh, at the State Department for Afghanistan. And the requirements were economics and statistics, nothing with languages, nothing with culture, nothing with religion, nothing with history, nothing with actually having lived in the area, et cetera. So um, I think we do have overall reliance on quantitative as opposed to qualitative. Do we have more questions uh, here in the back? Yeah, Bert Wides. Um, I feel in this panel I'm sort of listening or watching performance of Hamlet without Hamlet to an extent because uh, General Petraeus has been telling the public and Congress that we have made progress in reducing the capability of the Taliban, some significant progress in reducing their morale and in reducing their acceptance by the Afghan people. And that's been bolstered by some of the people that the Pentagon makes available to the New York Times or NPR to interview. The NIE, the National Intelligence Estimate, last fall, which the White House and Petraeus have tried to bury, contradicted Petraeus on each of those points and said we haven't made a significant dent in the order of battle, in the morale and motivation of the Taliban generally, or in their acceptance by the Afghan people. And if I'm wondering, A, why the think tanks and other pundits have not mentioned that in the last few weeks or months when we've had a torrent of information about progress. I think Jim and Peter both to an extent said that Taliban have suffered defeats and perhaps they did on a very focused tactical level, but they've been sending troops to the north to expand the breadth of their uh, involvement or waiting out the winter. And if the argument is made, as some do, that the data for that NIE was cut off around August or September, why they're not demanding and updating before the July decision, which could be done fairly quickly because the framework of metrics has been laid out and the reporting since then has been used in current intelligence reporting. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I guess we'll leave it to the panelists to decide who is Hamlet in this uh, scenario. Uh, I I'm <laughs> 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 Quickly on the NIE, any, any takers on that? Um, I would just, there's a, uh, you know, NIEs take a long time to do, as everybody knows. So there's a gap between publication and, and the information involved. But I would point to an independent source that's not on this panel and isn't to do with the U.S. military, which is an NGO based in Lashkagar and Kandahar uh, called ICOS. And ICOS is a long-time critic of Western policy in Afghanistan. And their surveys in the fall of this year in both Helmand and Kandahar uh, found, particularly in Helmand, that uh, respondents were saying the security is better. And I would also point to the BBC, after all, a fairly independent news organization, which found in polling of Helmandis that their security situation had improved, I think, from the 14 percent level to the 67 percent level in the last year or so. So there is some independent data uh, for these assessments. Just, yeah, three, three very quick points. Number one, the more things change, the more they stay, they stay the same. When you talked about NIEs versus commander assessments, it brought me back to the fall of 2007. Uh, summer 2007, an Iraq NIE that portrayed the violence uh, in a certain way. And then a few weeks later, uh, General Petraeus portraying it in a different way. I think there's challenges in gathering the data and interpreting the data. But I think point number two, there's been clear security progress in certain parts of Afghanistan. Uh, it doesn't surprise me we've got the finest military the world has ever known. You put them someplace, it'll have an impact. Uh, number three, the question is, is that impact sustainable? Have we cleared uh, uh, territory that we simply can't hand over and transition to Afghan partners? This was a key point that the President of the United States stressed in internal meetings. And I think it's a question that remains unanswered, uh, the sustainability question, which I think we need to f focus on. Did, did you want to jump in? So I just say, I don't think Petraeus or Peter or I 
are suggesting we're winning. We're just suggesting that we're no longer losing. Okay. Thank you very much. I have a question up here and then there. Hi, Peter. I have to hammer you a little. Uh, my name is Jake Diliberto. I represent a bipartisan coalition of veterans, Veterans for Rethinking Afghanistan. Uh, I'm uh, kind of perplexed. You said that security is getting better according to some NGO. There's 100% turnover of the ANA in Zabul province last quarter, 60% turnover in Helmand, 80% in Paktika. The army is comprised of Tajiks, uh, majority, not Pashtuns. Uh, the, 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 I mean, I'm kind of like, the, the security is getting better. Well, is it just because we're there, or is it because the Afghans are supporting Karzai? I mean, what's, what's the connection and disconnection? Question? Sorry, what is How the is security getting better? I, I, security, I mean, the data suggests that security is not getting better generally. I mean, the civilian casualty rate has gone up according to the United Nations, but it's getting the security situation certainly better in Helmand. I was in Nawa in September of 2009, and the, my main problem with that was boredom. Um, you know, uh, it, obviously in Sangin, there's been a big fight, but you know, most of Helmand is pretty secure. Also, if you have another independent analysis of all this, Carlotta Gould, who is basically the dean of Afghan correspondence, who's been reporting and living in Afghanistan since uh, the early 90s, when she goes into Argandab, when she goes into uh, other areas around Kandahar and says uh, security gains have happened and the Taliban has really been dealt with defeat, this isn't you know, a handout from ISAF. This is what's really happening. Okay. Jim, I, did you want to also address this? Christine. Okay, and Christine is going to leave, but we just wanted to thank her for her participation today and uh, her strong points. Yes, thank Christine. you very much. Thank you. I don't know if Christine saw that, but thanks, guys. Yeah. I think we're on a little delay. We're on the, the cutting edge of the digital frontier here, so <laughs> <laughs> I think we have we have time for a couple more uh, questions. I, I in the back there. I'm Ray McGovern. I know a little bit about national intelligence estimates, having chaired them for many years. <clears throat> there were two lists full. The first one was the one that Bert Wides referred to uh, about Afghanistan. The second was on Pakistan. The one in Afghanistan really concluded, we don't have a prayer to win this thing or even to prevail, whatever that means, without the full participation and cooperation of the Pakistanis on the other side of the Duran line. The one in Afghanistan said, there isn't a snowball chance in hell that we could get the Pakistanis to cooperate because they don't see the world the same way we do. So it's really important to know that there's a difference between 16 intelligence agencies in this, in this city and something that General Petraeus serves up because you know, having been through the Vietnam debacle, General Westmoreland with just as many rows of medals told us there were only 2,000 uh, 299,000 VC under arms. We said there were 600,000. Tet came two, day, two, two months later, and we were proven right. So intelligence estimates you have been wrong in the past, but when gutsy people put pen to paper and come up with gutsy conclusions, they should be given heed. Thank you very much. I, I'm not sure there was a question there, but... Uh... I, I would say that in 2007, it appears that the General Petraeus was right and the intelligence community wrong in their assessment of where the trends were going in Iraq. Um, I, I quite agree with your concluding comment, however. Thank you very much. If I can follow up on, on the Iraq, because I was there in 2007, and the difference between then and now was when we first got to Iraq in 06, my company and I, we were taking 50 or 60 attacks a day in our AO. Uh, by the spring of 07, we were down to six or seven attacks a day. Um, it was dramatic and it was very real and we've not seen that yet. We've not seen, and I'm not saying you're going to have an awakening or anything like that. I'm not comparing it here. But what I'm saying is that we've not seen any indicator to, to show us that the insurgency is fracturing or splitting uh, it, in any way that's going to matter on a strategic level. Uh, very quickly, between Iraq and Afghanistan, and I followed both, in Iraq in 07 through 08, the interesting dynamic was that elements of the insurgency were co-opted into the formal political process. There was some sort of incentive that pushed them, uh, including Sunni groups. This is a very sort of uh, oversimplified version of this, but Sunnis were out of the political process in 05. By 09, 2010, uh, 08, 09, they were in. I don't see that dynamic happening in Afghanistan right now because it's not even apples and oranges, it's apples and bicycles between the two countries. And the natures of the insurgency, I'm not as well versed on Afghanistan in terms of its insurgency, but it's much more fractured. And I don't see this process 
analysis that what was hoped for at the start of last year, for instance, of reconciliation, reintegration, pushing them into a formal process, I think in part because that formal process is seen as corrupt, broken, and not achieving the interests of ordinary Afghans themselves. That problem that was identified that I saw myself at the elections in 09, the presidential elections, is a very real dynamic that I think impedes uh, stability in the long run. All I can say is, look, thank God it's not Iraq. I mean, at the top of the, at the height of the Iraq war, you were 20 times more likely to be killed than you are today in Afghanistan. There's still more civilians being killed in Iraq today than there are in Afghanistan when you weighed it for population. Iraq was an industrial strength civil war. The, the problem is so much smaller in Afghanistan. So let's not, let's not sort of say that, you know, if only we, this could be Iraq. Uh, thank God we, it isn't Iraq. Uh, the problem is much, much smaller. And in fact, if the problem was more intense, uh, you know, it's conceivable that people would make the accommodations necessary. Uh, so if there really was a civil war going on, that, sometimes that gets people's attention. That's what happened in Iraq, essentially. People, the Sunnis essentially realized, look, we're essentially going on the wrong end of, of basically a, a potential extermination, uh, which uh, changed their views. We're not remotely in that type of situation in Afghanistan. Um, and for that, should we, we should be grateful. Um, with regards to, yeah, the comparison between Iraq and Afghanistan, certainly on a country level, the conflict different. American policy? Very similar. And our mindset towards it is very similar. Well, it's certainly uh, an analogy that we keep coming back to. I'm not sure if, if that's uh, good for Afghanistan or not, uh, but we certainly <laughs> we're, we're commingling these two conversations. I have another question there. Yeah. Hi, thank you. My name is Keith Bishop. I'm a senior first lieutenant with the Maryland Army National Guard. I've been to Iraq twice, not to Afghanistan. And uh, it's been great being here, being exposed to all this great stuff. Uh, it'll take some time for me to turn all the information into some kind of actionable, trainable material. Uh, within my organization, part of my job is to, I'm partially responsible for, for turning, uh, training our soldiers within Maryland to go overseas and, and work in uh, Iraq, Afghanistan, etc. Uh, some of those who will work with coalition uh, forces uh, as well as Afghanistan military and army and police and everything like that. Uh, question is, uh, what would anybody from the panel have as far as uh, uh, short, easy comments, information, suggestions have that I can pass along to the lieutenants, to lieutenant colonels who I'll be uh, making train ready to go over into Afghanistan and elsewhere. Thank you. Thank you very much. Brian. Thing, and I, I, first, thank you for your service. It, it, people say that a lot, but I, really, I mean, what you guys do is incredible and what our all-volunteer force does. Be clear and understand what your force is capable of doing. And this is one of my criticisms of the practicality of implementing counterinsurgency. We demand a lot of our 19 and 20 and 21-year-olds. At one moment, we want them to f be fierce warriors, w willing to kill, uh, able to kill. Uh, and we need that to protect America. And then we ask them to flip a switch and also be social workers and do a range of things. It's, it's, it's a general advice, but understand that translating that which is in manuals and sounds good to certain people who have studied the issue is very hard to do. And I think we've had awful outliers like the kill team incident where we see things have gone wrong. It's very hard to marshal all of these forces at the, the lower level. And I admire, you know, people who are trying to do this. But be very specific about that which you want them to get done. I was speaking to a uh, former general who had significant experience in Iraq, knows Afghanistan very well. And he was saying that point I was making. We ask so much of uh, these younger men and women, and we don't equip them with sort of all of the tools that we expect them to have in implementing very sophisticated campaigns. So, you know, as uh, the recent doctor wrote in that book about having lists and very specific instructions, I think that's important to do. To have that, you need to have great clarity at the strategic level coming down uh, to you. And I think I agree with them. Ambassador Dobbins has gotten a lot better, but we still, I don't think, have that great moment of clarity uh, in, in implement. Matthew, as someone who's who's worn both hats in a way of giving the advice and being on the receiving end of it. Yeah, um, you know, with your weapon systems, you don't train just against a seven meter target, right? You add range, you add depth, you add complexity, you throw some smoke in there, you do some movement. Same thing when you're training for these political engagements. You can't go in there just against role players with the same script you've been using for three years. I, I tell people, I was helping a friend of mine do this kind of stuff in Germany, and he's from Long Island. I said, if you're going to go and occupy Long Island, you would not expect the Nassau County Commission that you're working with to have a very simple political background. 
It will be something that goes back decades and is very complex. And that's what your training needs to include. It can't just be political training against a seven meter target. Um, and please feel, yeah, please come up to me afterwards and I can put you in touch with some folks who can help you out. Thank all of our panelists. I think we've, uh, you know, not necessarily come to a conclusion on what our options are, but uh, certainly serviced them all. So thank all, all of you and thank you for your questions. Thank you.